So you've got Chinese all over the world now, and many of them are clear operatives. And they have open police stations in places like Dublin and in New York City. They can kidnap you easily, and you'll end up in China. They could kidnap us today. They could literally, hey, there's the ocean right here. They can kidnap us, we'll be on a boat, airplane, we're off in Beijing, we're in a dungeon. These are serious people. This yep. is an actual invasion. And I'm not using that word lightly or flippantly. This is a real invasion. Famine creates famine. Right. And pandemic creates pandemic. And war creates war. Right. Like this idea like, hey, let's run over and have a little war in Ukraine. It's like, that's not how this works. Anybody that tells you that they know how to control a war is a fool. And you should just shut the door on them. So I'm with Michael Gon. We've been down here for almost a week. We were down in the Darien Gap. And could you just walk through the importance of the Darien Gap just at a high level so people understand exactly what's going on and why should they, they should give a f about what's going on down there? Sure. We've been here more than a week. <laughs> we were in Darien Gap almost a week, right? Six days or something. Yeah, right? yeah. And, uh, and so uh, there's so many other things to research here. Of course, there's the, the Panama Canal and that sort of thing. But the Darien Gap is a funnel from the rest of the world to the United States. It's an hourglass. In other words, if you look how Colombia connects to the Darien Isthmus, the Darien Isthmus is that spit of land that comes from Panama and connects with Colombia, South America. And uh, so we have people from all over the world, more than 140 countries are coming from Africa, and, uh, a, a few in Europe, uh, many from Asia, and also South America. For instance, Venezuela has just been dumping out through Colombia up into uh, through Panama to the United States. About 1,200 people a day is the in instantaneous rate, but it's increasing, right? Uh, it's been increasing. Every time I come, the number is higher and higher. And the, uh, at, at the rate that it's going now, so that would be roughly 400,000 at this instantaneous rate for the next year. Uh, but it's clearly going to be some number significantly higher than that. Mm -hmm. Of course, Mayorkas just came and he said that their, you know, uh, Secretary of uh, Homeland Security, Mayorkas, um, himself from Cuba, by the way, he said that, um, that you know, that they're going to close this down, which is obviously nonsense, because we can see you were just in the camps. You can see that they're still putting in bunk beds that still had plastic on them, right? I mean, yeah. a, obviously, the, and they're clearing land to put more trailers in for the San Vicente camp that you were in, and mm -hmm. you were in Las Blancas camp. And you you droned it. You've got to show this drone footage, and and then when you come back in a few months, drone it again and see how it looks. Yeah, uh, one of the things. So that was my first time there. But you mentioned when we were there that it had expanded since the last time that you were there. So could you just talk about that expansion that you've personally seen? Oh yeah, last April. Okay, this is April of 2023. We're talking now. Last April in 2022, I was there at the same camps, and Mayorkas came, and in fact, I waited for him for four days. At the place where you saw the helicopters land, and uh, and he now, Cinefront and others had told me that the camps were expanding, right? And then he landed and announced they were expanding the camps, and they have the camps have more than doubled in size. San Vicente Camp, the one that you were in with full access, has more than doubled in size, and Las Blancas, I would say triple or quadrupled. It's uh, it's hard to tell because of the way it's grown. It's not like a geometric you, you know it's a hard shape to measure it in the way that things have grown but the numbers that are coming through um, you know a couple of years ago it would be like 30,000 people a year now it's more like 400 000. let's just go to those numbers right and these are the numbers that we know right uh, that could be roughly 400,000 in the next year but I think it's going to be much higher because again that's the instantaneous rate of about 1,200 people per day now that are coming from all over the world bringing their multi-drug resistant, you know, tuberculosis and, and everything else. Who, who knows what's coming up through there? Ebola, we keep hearing about, you know, people trying to sell vaccines for you. I read a great book on Ebola, by the way. But, and, you know, I read that uh, in part because I'm a war correspondent and, and, and another part because I see so many Africans coming through the Darien Gap, right? Mm -hmm. And this, anyway, we could talk about that for hours, but any further questions, sir? Okay, yeah, a couple more, <laughs> just two more. Um, could you, you've talked a lot while we were on this trip about replacement migration and how it's weaponized. And you were talking about the Kulaks. Could you explain that so people have context as to why this matters? Because a lot of people are going to be like, oh, it's for humanitarian reasons. And they don't see the bigger picture or the dangers of this. 
Right. It's not about humanitarian. If it was about humanitarian, why would the IOM, which is paid for by largely by U.S. tax money, or I, it's OIM on this bag, but sometimes it's IOM, depending on which language, but it's the Organization for um, Immigration and Migration, right? And they're all over the world. I see them, for instance, in Schiphol Airport in uh, Netherlands, in Amsterdam, facilitating flights to Quito for some of the Chinese in Ecuador, who then take buses up. But why would, if this is about humanitarian reasons, why would U.S. taxpayer money be handing out these rape kits? These aren't rape kits to, uh, you know, to to keep you from getting raped or to test the, if you've been raped. These are rape kits to get raped. These are female condoms handed out by U.S. tax money. Male condoms, like, uh, you're about to get raped, please wear the condom. Here's abortion pills. Uh, I think these are like 50 bucks each, by the way. There's four of them. These are handed out. But water purification's not handed out, right? Meanwhile, we got you know people dying from waterborne illnesses every day. And if this were about uh, humanitarian purposes, why would they be... Not why would they not be handing out water pills instead right. of abortion pills, right? Right. And you know they're handing out actual maps showing you how to invade the United States. I mean these maps are unbelievably detailed. Wait till you show this to people at home. You know this is a map that you found. Actually, you got I don't know who you got it off of. You got off one of the migrants, right? Yeah, and, I actually pulled that from the Red Cross. Oh, you got that from? Oh yeah, this was the map that Red Cross tried to cut off their name, right? Where is yeah. their name on here? It's it's on they, the other side. But yeah, they, like it, yeah. Anyway, and it's got a QR code on here somewhere. There it is, and you know, it's got super detailed on where to go. You know, and it's unbelievable. And uh, yeah, and then when you were getting it from Red Cross, they tried to cut their Red Cross name off of it. Right. It's on the back here somewhere. Anyway. So that's, well, it's up at the top. That was actually yeah. another map they tried cutting off. Oh, it's it's all one and the same. You know? Yeah, it's, like, it's the same thing. Yeah. And then, you know, we see so many Chinese, mainland Chinese coming through. And some of them clearly appear to be uh, public security, uh, which would be like their FBI. Uh, and, and I'm not just saying this randomly. This is what I do. You know, I've spent a lot of time in China. I've spent a lot of time kind of doing this sort of work, you, you might say. And some of them are clearly like... Um, uh, GS, which would be General Staff, which would be the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, sort of, uh, sort of their intelligence paramilitary operatives. Mm -hmm. Some of those appear to be them. Uh, others appear to be MSS, which is the Ministry of State Security, which is the, uh, which is sort of like their CIA, right? So I mean, we've got some that are, and they show specific indicators that that's who they are, right? Uh, a lot of the, these people haven't been doing it for very long. They're young. They leak information. Like we saw one the other night that we're calling China Ninja now because he was like a ninja, but he was Chinese. Mm -hmm. And we, we talked with him. He was he was fatigued. He was tired from coming through the gap. He was um, he was uh, hungry and he was itching. He was itching a lot. He had been bitten by the bugs out. At, I think there were Mongai bugs that that certain kind of bugs. In that part of the jungle he comes through, I've been through that part. Mm -hmm. There's these little bugs that the Embora Indians called Morangai. In, in that area of the jungle, they're horrific. I hate those things, man. And he was itching. Remember how much he was scratching? And he was he was in that emotional state. He was leaking information he shouldn't have talked about, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he was, for instance, uh, he said he was using specific techniques like, oh, you know, I'm mentally ill which is a, a defense technique as you had a conversation last night with an interesting person who was verifying some of these things. Uh, he was um, talking about, um, you know, don't take my photo. I'm going to the United States to get dental work, and which is nonsense. You know, people that are going for dental work, it, they don't come all the way from China to get dental work. They do it in China where it's cheaper and just as good, right? Mm -hmm. Or they go to Thailand. You'll have Americans all the time fly to Thailand to get dental work. I have an office in Thailand. They'll, I mean, I'm very well aware of this. If you want to get dental work, you don't do it in the United States. You go take a vacation to Thailand and you get it done over there where it's cheap, right? right? Now, we saw some Chinese. We saw a lady drive up and a truck, Chinese lady, and she gave this box was filled with money, U.S. dollars, because that's the money in Panama. It was filled with money. She gave it to six of the Chinese who had just come out of the jungle. I mean, where does this come from? Right. You know what I mean? Right. Now, these you may have seen it on Epoch Times today. Well, it's live 
30 minutes ago uh, uh, with Josh Phillip, a friend of mine. He's got a show going on right now talking about these Chinese that were just arrested in New York, I think yesterday or day before, mm -hmm. uh, who were working for the public security. That's who I mentioned earlier. That's sort of like their FBI. Masako Ganaha and I went to one of their police stations, Chinese police station, in London. And we went to another one in Dublin, Ireland, right? And they're all over the world, including New York, including here in Panama, right? And these people are part of the apparatus. They will apply Chinese CCP law, Chinese Communist Party law, to Chinese. And keep in mind, there's a reason why Hong Kongers call CCP Chi Nazis. They call them Chi Nazis, Chinese Nazis, because they are ultra racist. Be, they're, first of all, what is a Nazi? Well, the Nazi party, let's define why the Chinese in Hong Kong, or let's say the Hong Kongers would call them Chi Nazis. Uh, I spent seven months there until I got kicked out, actually, and you can see on TV where I'm getting ex uh, uh, escorted to the airplane, right, mm -hmm. <laughs> by, the, by the police. But the, the uh, Chi Nazis, well, fascism is where government and, uh, and business so commingle that they're indistinguishable, right? Mm -hmm. The tree and the bark, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're just, they're the same, right? Uh, they become the same thing. That's fascism, right? Now, of course, people go, no, fascism was in Italy. Okay, we got it, right? Uh, but that's fascism. It's where those commingle, right? Nazism, as in the Nazi party, they took fascism and they put a strong racial component on it, right? That's Nazism, right? Like killing the Jews, killing the Gypsies, killing the Polish people, right? Mm -hmm. So that was, that was uh, that's Nazism. And that's how the Chinese roll. The Chinese Communist Party, Han Chinese, they are looking to wipe out, for instance, the Cantonese-speaking Hong Kongers, right? They've been using weaponized migration for years, uh, bringing uh, mainlanders, Han Chinese, into Mandarin speakers, into Cantonese-speaking Hong Kong, and slowly taking over the system, right? Mm -hmm. This is sort of, um, this is a, a something that we see everywhere, all over Europe, where I spend a lot of time as well. You can see that the same weaponized migration is working, right? Now, you mentioned, you asked about kulaks. Yeah. And uh, I'm sorry, I almost went off, or I did go off on a long tangent, but well, let's good. go back to, the main, yeah. back to the main course here. Yeah. Kulaks. Uh, you know, with Stalin, uh, he, he uh, uh, really made the name kulak evil, right? So first of all, kulaks do this, kulaks do that, like Jews do this, Jews do that, whatever. Fascists do this. Or, or, I mean, now they're calling anybody fascist in the United States that... They don't like or white supremacists, right? So they'll they'll make the label first. And Stalin did this with kulaks. Kulaks were mostly farmers, and they were uh, they were more wealthy people at times, or poor farmers. It didn't matter. He wanted the farmland, right? Mm -hmm. And he wanted to wipe out their social structures. So first he made the lab the the name evil, and then he hung that name on everybody that he wanted to kill and take their land from. So so basically, all oh, kulaks do this. They make the prices higher. They you know, they're the reason why this, they're the, you know, the disease that broke out, it was the kulaks that did it, that sort of thing, right? And then he brought in people and said, kill the kulaks and keep their farms, right? They had a huge famine, the Holodomor, 32, 30, 1932 and 33 in Ukraine, that was just part of it. And, uh, and he took their land, right? Mm -hmm. So, but again, first make the label bad and then hang that label on anybody that you don't like make the Jewish name bad and then wear the Star of David or the Polish name wear the P, right? And then kill the Poles, kill the Jews, right? There were actually, the Polish were just obliterated in World War II. It's a wonder any of them even survived, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and the same happened with the Kulaks, right? Big famine happened. Now, Mao, who was a, a student of Stalin, and in other words, he wasn't really in a school or something, but he, you know, he, uh, he revered Stalin, and he took, took a lot of his techniques, and he supersized them to Chinese proportions, and he did the same thing. And that's where you see, there's a great book on it called Mao's Great Famine. I highly suggest reading it. But Mao's Great, first I would read about the Holodomor, the, the, um, the, the, the famine in Ukraine. And then if you read Mao's Great Famine, you'll see how he took that, what Stalin did in Ukraine and other places, and supersized it to Chinese proportions, labeled the, you know, the... The, the people that he wanted to kill and took their farms, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening now in Netherlands, where I spend a lot of time as well. They're making the farmers look bad. They're polluting the land with stickstoff, which is nitrogen, is what they're saying. And they're trying to take that land from the farmers. Why are they doing that in Netherlands? They're doing it specifically in Netherlands because Netherlands, 
uh, is got has the biggest port in Europe called Rotterdam, right? And the terminus of the uh, railway that goes all the way from Shanghai and Chengdu and other parts of China, you'll see that, you know, sort of that, like that river delta of, of railways that goes all the way across uh, Asia and, and it, the terminus or the beginning is Rotterdam, the biggest harbor in Europe, one of the top 10 harbors in the world. And just south of Rotterdam is Antwerp in Belgium, right? Mm -hmm. And Ant those are the two biggest harbors in Europe. And they're both in the top 10 of the world, right? So these are key ports. So what they're trying to do now and we're succeeding at is taking farmland from Dutch farmers. That's why I spend so much time over there. It's not a coincidence that we're now sitting in Panama and I just recently was in Netherlands, right? For their election on March 15th. Mm -hmm. uh, they're taking that land. The farmers own more than 60% of the land in Netherlands and they need to get them off of that land to the World Economic Forum and uh, Chinese Communist Party are co-sanguinated. You know, they have the annual meetings in Davos and also in China, right? So there's also annual meetings in China. Nobody seems to talk about, but it's right on their website. It's not hidden, right? Mm -hmm. And so they, they, they both have this common goal of, of making tri-state city in Netherlands, Belgium, and Germany. Tri-state city. Tri-state city is three-state city. Most of Netherlands, part of Germany, and part of Belgium to make the super smart city of about 30 million people which contains Antwerp Harbor and Rotterdam Harbor right at the end of the belt of the railway that goes all the way over to China right mm -hmm. you see how this all works together yeah right outside our window here is the Panama Canal five percent of the world trade goes through there right so Panama is vital just as Netherlands is vital right Netherlands is vital for your Netherlands and Belgium with those two harbors and, uh, and other reasons make that just key landscape, as is Panama, Panama Canal here. So you were at the, you were at the Confucius Institute yesterday mm -hmm. at the University of Panama. That's where they recruit spies. Basically, they come in and they, the Confucius Institutes, I've been attacking them since 2014. They come and they, the Chinese Communist Party, well, they don't say we're the Chinese Communist Party. They say, you know, we're, we're here to help. You know, Mandarin, you know, uh, China is a big part of the future of the world and it's important that your, you know, your, your uh, students speak Mandarin and understand a lot about China so you can work with us, right? Mm -hmm. And so what they'll do is the Chinese Communist Party using the Confucius Institutes will come in and they'll offer like Caltech or MIT or Princeton or whatever, Yale, they'll offer them a lot of money to put a Confucius Institute in there and they'll bring in uh, pretty uh, uh, Mandarin uh, teachers and uh, and then they will you know they'll they'll supply the actual books they'll teach history and they'll teach mandarin and then they will they will specifically try to get the the children of the elite families right to come to those classes and then they will offer them scholarships to go study in china right mm -hmm. and that's where they'll do the mice thing you know they'll get them uh you know recruiting agents for the future mice is a is a, a counterintelligence technique of of where you're uh, recruiting spies, right? So there's four major ways, the MICE techniques, right? Money, ideology, coercion, and ego, right? So one of the ways that they'll, first of all, they'll, they'll have these young people over there, the students of the, the families of the elite, and they'll be in China and they'll find out what you like. Uh, what kind of girls you like, what kind of boys you like, whatever you like, do you do drugs, whatever. And they'll get all that on video, of course, and audio, and they'll get all kinds of coercive material in the ice, right, or in, in the mice, right, and um, and they'll find out, you know, what it takes to recruit you, right, or if you're recruitable. And most of the people will be, because remember, you're coming into a well-developed mouse trap, right? They know exactly how to do this, right? Um, and meanwhile, the people coming over are like 20 years old. You know what I mean? Right. They right. have no idea that they're coming into this highly sophisticated recruitment system that's been working for generations and many generations and they're very very good at this right right and so over time they'll end up infiltrating governments around the world you see Confucius Institutes in Canada all over the United States uh, all over Europe uh, right here in Panama City so there's all these different things going on whether it's taking China is coming to take Panama they're not coming here to influence Panama they're coming to take Panama. It will take a long time. It may take several generations. It may take only 30 or 40 years, but they will take Panama at the going rate, right? And one of the ways that they're doing this, of course, is the Confucius Institute, economic development, 
of course, they're talking about working to build another bridge over the over the Panama Canal, which the Panamanians greatly want. They're trying to make a smart city out of Cologne, right? And they will genocide these people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the Han Chinese do genocide the way some people go order pizza. They're right now, I've been to Tibet. They're genociding the Tibetans. That's just part of their culture. They do genocide, period. They're genociding the Uyghurs uh, in Xinjiang. They're the Tibetans in Tibet. Uh, they're genociding the Mongolians. They've genocided themselves. Like nobody has killed more Chinese than Chinese. Mm -hmm. Like Mao's great famine, right? He really wiped out a lot of Chinese. And, um, and Hong Kongers, they're doing a soft genocide there by doing the same things. There's a Confucius Institute at the University of Hong Kong. I've been in it, actually, uh, before they kicked me out. Like, really kicked me out. Like, put me on the airplane, kicked me out, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, But I was there for seven months on my last trip, right? When, that, when Hong Kongers were rising up and fighting back and that sort of thing. And now Hong Kong's been taken. But they're doing a soft genocide there by doing the weaponized migration, bringing people in. They're taking Chinese, they're taking Hong Kong students over to mainland China to, to go through the same programs that they'll take Panamanians or American elite or Germans or whatever in the, in the same programs. And, and, uh, and, uh, and then they're, you know, they're, they're also taking over the schools like they're doing in Japan. They do it through teachers unions in Japan, right? And they'll do these, um, uh, you know, many different programs, right? Uh, and uh, and so that's what they're doing. It's it's a very comprehensive program. It's not just like, hey, we're going to come in and and bribe a few people. Right. Oh no, this is their, this is a farm, right? right? And and actually, you'll hear operatives will use the word farm. Who uses the word farm? Quo. That's interesting, right? <laughs> Miles Quo. Now I'm going to take pain for going against Quo again publicly, but I'm telling you, something's not right with him. He's sitting in prison right now, or sitting in jail right now for fraud. Now, I'm going to get some sharp emails for saying something bad about Guo. I've never trusted that guy. You know, something's wrong here. Now, with Guo, he's very anti-vax, but he will never talk about the origins of COVID. This is important. There's a, an important distinguish. Uh, Xi, President Xi, is all, he's fine about talking. You can talk all the anti-vax you want, but never talk about the origins of COVID, right? That's... This is important. Guo will not talk about, he will never talk bad about Xi. Now you'll find a lot of these people coming in, the MSS people, the GS people, or the rest, they'll talk bad about CCP. They'll talk bad, bad about the Chinese Communist Party, but they usually won't talk bad about Xi. Mm -hmm. That's verboten, right? Mm -hmm. So this is interesting. So Xi's fine with you talk. This is part of your, you know, part of the way to get in. Okay, it's okay to talk bad about CCP, Chinese Communist Party, but don't talk bad about Pooh Bear, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not even allowed to have a Pooh Bear toy in China because he looks like Weenie the Pooh. Wow. Right. If you look at Xi, if you have a Weenie the Pooh t-shirt and you land in Beijing, I don't think they're going to let me back in Beijing, but they'll be like... Uh, why are you wearing this shirt, sir? You know, oh, wow. if you have June Fourth on your T-shirt, you're not getting in. Not with that T-shirt for sure. Not mm -hmm. if you're American. June Fourth was the date the for Tiananmen Square. So June Fourth is like a verboten date. We don't talk about June Fourth, right? That's why you'll see Hong Kongers all the time talking about June Fourth. Hong Kongers will be like, "What about June Fourth? You know, because you know Hong Kongers are fighting back. They're Cantonese speakers. They even look different to me. Of course, I've spent years in Asia. I've spent more than half of my life in other countries. I've been all over Asia. I mean, it's funny to me. Asians are like, you don't know anything about Asia. You've, you know, you're not Asian. I'm like, what, what countries in Asia have you been to? You're Korean. You've never even been out of Korea. I've been 25 countries just in Asia, right? I've been all over Korea. I've been all over China. I've been all over, you know, Vietnam and Thailand and, you know, uh, just all over Asia, right? Uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, you know what I mean? I'm constantly in Asia. They'll throw this Asian card like you can't understand what's going on here because you're not Asian. Mm -hmm. And it's like, get get out of here. You know what I mean? That's yeah. like some somebody from Germany saying you don't know anything about Europe. And it's like, oh, what? Because you don't speak German, right? Yeah. Okay. Do you speak Norwegian? Do you speak Italian? You know what I mean? Do you speak, you know... Uh, uh, Caldonian, you know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's a litmus yeah. test you would know nothing yeah, about anything. Uh, exactly. Yeah. So they'll throw that card on you, right? Right. And so the Chinese Communist Party people will do that all the time as well. Whenever they start throwing that on you, you don't know anything about Asia because you're not Asian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
that is a sharp indicator. It's not, it's not proof, but it's an indicator that they're coming from that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. There are certain words that they'll use, like you heard the other night, the word roaches. You heard the word roaches from, we call him China Ninja now. He was that ninja guy that came out itching from the jungle, dressed in black, acting like he's Mr. Ninja, right? We call him China Ninja because he's a Chinese ninja. This he actually the, threatened Masako Ganaha. This was a Chinese guy that came walking up the Panamanian, uh, the Pan American Highway uh, and passed our hotel in the middle of the night, and we called him over, and he started talking to us. That's the context. That yeah, we're about. Oh, that's right. Sorry, content. But he actually threatened Masako Ganaha, who's sitting right behind the camera here. She's a famous Japanese journalist. He actually threatened her, and uh, she's actually Japanese. And uh, and uh, anyway, China Ninja. Remember, he was using the word roaches. That's right. And that's, right. that's often, that's a term that you'll hear sometimes from people from that ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Nobody genocides quite like Han Chinese. It's just like part of the culture. We come in and we slash and burn, right? And it, it's just happened. It just happens. It's like the tide coming and going through there. Mm -hmm. The more you study, the more you're like, wait a minute. This is just how they roll, right? Yeah. And, and that's how they roll. That's why I keep warning the Panamanians. They will genocide you. They will kill every one of you. They'll, ru they'll either kill you or run you off or give you vaccines that make you not have babies, right? And you notice the lockdowns in, in Panama were like North Korea level lockdowns. The only place they were probably worth, worse was probably China itself, right? Mm -hmm. The lockdowns, the COVID, vac the lockdowns here were absolutely severe. Mm -hmm. They were over the top. They were worse than anything California ever saw, right? Yeah, I mean, they were like, you know, men couldn't leave the house. Uh, they could only leave on, I think, I can't remember, Mondays or Wednesdays. Uh, and I think Fridays for like two hours a day. And when the hours that you could leave depended on the numbers on the on the on on your national ID That's and right. that sort of thing. That's right. You know, and they came out and they were forcing all the Indians to take vaccines, uh, fake vaccines. I shouldn't use the word vaccine because they're clearly... You know, they're whatever they are. You know? And I know some people are like, they're experimental mRNA. You don't know that. You know what I mean? If you're just thinking that, you've been supplied that answer. If you just thought, well, they're experimental mRNA, say no more. You were supplied that answer. This is a typical information war technique. When, when we started to realize they're not vaccines, then they're like, okay, let's fall back to a new fighting position. They're experimental mRNA. You have no evidence whatsoever that they're experimental. Mm -hmm. You don't have it. I know you don't have it. Send it to me if you do, but you don't have it. And you have, no, you have no evidence that they're mRNA anything. You don't have it. It does not exist. If anything, they were well experimented on in the years prior to this happening, this warp speed bullshit, right? And it was already developed, right? We don't know that. I don't know that. We don't know where these things came from. We have no evidence that they just suddenly made these things quickly, right? Right. I mean, I've been studying this stuff for years. I'm a war correspondent, right? And one of the things I study in war is pandemic. Uh, before this pandemic, I had read about 40 books on pandemic. And during the lockdown, I read 20 more. I'm, that's 60 books, right? I'm reading another one now on the leprosy colony, the leper colony in Hawaii and Molokai, right? Why? Because pandemic, famine, and war, they go together, right? It's funny, I was saying this on an interview a couple of years ago. I call it PAMF war, pandemic, famine, war, right? They go together like the three musketeers. Mm -hmm. And that's why I call it Panford. One of my longtime readers, a lady, she said, you know, she was a call-in, she said, you know, you, you, you talk about Panford as if you made this up. And I said, I did. And she goes, no, it's in the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. It's the four horsemen. I was like, sorry about that. You're right. <laughs> and that's probably where I got it from. But I just source amnesia, right? Uh -huh. uh, because it's clearly actually in the Bible. They knew about it 2,000 years ago or whenever they wrote that down, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, these pandemic and famine, if you find a big war, you will always find pandemic and famine. Like World War II, there was quite a few famines in there. But people don't generally talk about those. Uh, but there were. Like in Iran, there was a famine in World War II. There was, there was, there was famine in um, Netherlands. They call it the Hoogerventer. 44, 45, that was only like six month famine. There are, all, there are all kinds of little famines. Typhus always breaks out. There's always pandemic, famine, and where they go together. Mm -hmm. If you get a big pandemic, you'll, I mean a big one, not some little outbreak or some minor league uh, pandemic, because there's always pandemics. There's pandemics always going on, and most of them we don't know about because they're b below the threshold of, uh, they're not killing people, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and by the way, I talk with virologists and whatnot all the time, bacteriologists, mycologists, all these sorts of things. Those are not 
experts on pandemic. Pandemic is this whole other thing. There's no PhD program that I know of on pandemic. Viruses are one of the causes of pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. um, but pandemic is, let's use the equivalent of fire. Let's say virology is like the study of the chemical, if this, if this uh, curtain burns in a fire, what chemicals are given off? You know, you can study your whole life on chemistry and organic chemistry and all these sorts of things in organic chemistry. And like, okay, these are the chemicals that are given off. These are the amount of calories that are given off when, that, when those things, you know, when those uh, molecules are liberated or whatever. Yeah. That's, 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 the, that's the virology level. But then there's this other level, which is pandemic, which is, hey, the hotel's on fire. Everybody's got to get out. Right? right? That's your pandemic. That's this other thing. The fire and all the chemistry and all that, that's fine. And it's related to, you know, is it poison? Or actually, all smoke is poison. So, you know, and um, and uh, toxic. Uh, but, um, but, um, but the pandemic part, like what people do in pandemic, how they react, how pandemics create other pandemics, how pandemic creates famine, how pandemic creates war, how war creates pandemic, how famine creates pandemic. I mean, these things, there is no PhD on famineology, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there needs, I've, I've looked far and wide for experts on famine. I mean, real experts on famine, not experts on starvation. That's like being an expert on virology, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, you studied starvation, right? But that's not famine, right? So these things go together. I've been studying them for years, and um, the, I wish there were a PhD program I would enroll in it. Maybe I should start one. I don't know. Yeah. But at this, so all I do is read about and study and go to different wars and, and famines and, and not famines. I haven't been to any famines actually. Uh, there's actually interestingly, there aren't any big famines in recent times. The last really huge one was in was in China. Right. Mm. I mean, there's small ones all the time. I say small, like a million people dead or something. Right. But it's not like 50 million people and, you know, Mao's great famine. Uh, it's not like that sort of thing. Right. But it's interesting how famine creates famine right. and pandemic creates pandemic and war creates war. Right. Like this idea like, hey, let's run over and have a little war in Ukraine. It's like that's not how this works. Anybody that tells you that they know how to control a war is a fool and you should just shut the door on them, right? Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm going to start this fire and I know how it's going to go. No, you don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? You have no idea how this fire is going to go. The winds change, you know, something happens, you know, and uh, suddenly there's a, you know, uh, a, a, a blast of wind comes in and blows the sparks across the river. Nobody knows how wars go once they start, right? And anybody who claims they do is an absolute quack. I don't care if he's a four-star general, he's been in eight wars. It's, it just doesn't know. It's the same with pandemic. You don't know how they're going to go. It's the same with famines. Famine creates more famine until it, bur it reaches some magical turning point and it goes away, right? Okay. And then people go, wow, those people were stupid. We'd never do that. And then you do it again, mm -hmm. right? Because that's just how the cycle works, right? Mm -hmm. It's cyclical. I mean, we're going to see big famines in the future, but we could talk about that for a and, and, and so in closing, just to, just to make, make sure this goes full circle. So all of that relates to, let's just tie this and show this, how all those things that you just spoke about tie directly into the mass right. migration into the United States through Central America, right? Like having, for example, the Kulaks, having millions, tens of millions of illiterate people with no money, no resources pouring across yeah. into the United States, how that's going to then lead to a Kulak type of situation. Just as an example, just so we can make this go full circle. Yeah. Well, weaponization of migration is an old tactic. It's been done since forever. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, even that's biblical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think they call it that in the Bible, but uh, but basically, how how could this work in the United States? So it could work in many ways. One is while well, they're handing out phones, uh, smartphones, uh, you know, Obama phones, that sort of thing. That's one way. But you don't even need to do that. It's easy. Uh, a lot of people watching this will be. I mean, obviously, your readership's quite smart. They realize how all of our phones can be tracked. Mm -hmm. All of our made it. It can. It's easy to see that we're in this hotel room together because our devices are together, right? Right. right. And you don't have to be the NSA or MSS to do this, right? You don't have to be, you know, uh, general headquarters or whatever. You know, you 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 can you can be a private. So many Twitter, Facebook, the 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 the, the flashlight app on your iPhone collects your uh, geographic data, right? I mean, all these sorts of things, right? And you can buy this data and you can buy it from brokers just like you can, if you've got the money, you can buy it today. You don't need to 
put in an application for it and show that you're not going to use it in bad ways, you can buy it right now. All you need is the money and you can buy the data. You can I know somebody you can buy it from right now, right? And there's a lot of people that have this data, right? And they're data brokers. And then all you need to do is analyze it. Like if you want to know everybody who comes through the Panama Canal, well, that's easy. They have phones. They go through Copper Gana, their cell phone towers there. They come through. And once they get through the Darien Gap, boom, they're on the cell. Okay, I'm going somewhere with this. Mm -hmm. Then they, okay, here's your target audience. We know these are people who came through Darien Gap. Now they come up through other AI and other sorts of things. You can see how they switched phones at this time or the other time they're all over the united states right mm -hmm. you can easily target them with text or ads or whatever uh, all the different ways that it's done uh, algorithms and give them instructions right and by the way this is a an old war technique is to give general instructions right in other words not like hey uh anthony go do this on you know such and such date at you know two o'clock in the morning right it'll be more general over the radio, like the blue bird flew from the tree, you know, stuff like that, <laughs> or it'll just be general instructions. Now it's time for everyone to do their Chinese duty. Go back to Han Chinese again and the Chai Nazis. The, they're setting up police stations around the world, including here in Panama City, right? Mm -hmm. And they claim, the Chinese Communist Party, anybody with Chinese genes is obligated racially to fall under CCP law. So you, your family could have been out of China for 400 years in Taiwan or over in Indonesia or 200 years in the United States. They could have been in the 1840s and 50s building the railroads, right? Or building the railroad here in, in uh, Panama Canal in, you know, in the, in the, during the gold rush, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of Chinese that live here, especially Cantonese speakers, uh, that are actually, their ancestors were here building the railroad across the Panama Canal before the canal was here, right? Mm -hmm. There was a railroad before the canal was here, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, a lot of those people that built, did that were Chinese. They've been here, they speak Spanish they, as fluently as any Panamanian, right? And so, uh, and mostly they also still speak Cantonese, right? And so, um, but the CCP claims that due to your genes, you are beholden to the Chinese Communist Party. Wow. And they set up these police stations. It's not just, I mean, they are administering Chinese law, right? They have kidnapped people, like from Thailand, off and sent them right back to China. We know this is a fact because China didn't hide it. They kidnapped Chinese from Hong Kong in Thailand, right? And brought them up to China. Holy this shit. Is, this is public. They, the booksellers, from Hong, I've been to their book uh, store. It's closed in Hong Kong, right? Um, so, I mean, imagine that here. So you've got Chinese all over the world now, and many of them are clear operatives. And they have open police stations in places like Dublin and in New York City and in, in uh, London and all over the world. China, right? I mean, it has police stations in, in Panama and Mexico, all over the place. Just busted one in New York. Just busted. The day before. It's, on, it's on Epoch Times today. Yeah, Josh yeah. Phillips is just, I mean, we were, I was just watching it before we started this yeah, right yeah. and and the thing is is they can kidnap you easily and you'll end up in china they could kidnap us today they could literally hey there's the ocean right here they can kidnap us we'll be on a boat airplane we're off in beijing we're in a dungeon it's that simple it's like picking up a package right it's like you're in the trunk of a car now you're on a boat and now you're back in china and this is very easy to do. They have the intelligence networks to do it. They have the operatives. You see some of these men coming through Darien Gap. Do those look like innocent guys to you? Yeah. They're buffed oh. up. They, look at some of the muscles on these guys. I mean, look at, the, look at their eyes, the way they're looking at things. You're right. They're completely alert. These aren't, these aren't like the Venezuelans coming in who are like, oh, wow, you know. These guys are like totally on it. They're looking at you, looking at them. They're making videos of you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is serious guys. They're mm -hmm. texting. You know what I mean? They're, 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 you know, we know that we know some that you've seen, heard some of the phone calls, some of the things that are going on. Um, yeah, these are serious people. This yep. is an actual invasion. And I'm not using that word lightly or flippantly. This is a real invasion. Some of it is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, innocently weaponized. In other words, people that are just uh, uh, like Venezuela is obviously collapsed under the left wing government. Colombia is now collapsing. Many of the Venezuelans were in Colombia. When Masako and I were down there with Chuck Colton, there were Venezuelans everywhere. Mm -hmm. Chuck Colton was just down there again. I think he just left today or yesterday. 
he said he's not seeing any Venezuelans anymore because mm-hmm. they've all dumped out. They've all gone through dairy and in other ways, and they're up in places like the United States, right? And now we see a lot of Colombians coming through, right, because Colombia is also collapsing, right? Parts of it are. And um, so there can be that sort of replacement, which is just people just showing up in numbers. And then there are the actual paramilitary swords. And you, again, look at some of the videos you just made and look how serious some of these guys are. Yeah. And they're clearly acting as units. You saw this at night when they're walking down the, or, or walking up the, uh, the Pan American Highway yep. at nighttime. Yep. Uh, midnight, they're walking, and they're clearly focused. They got a mission. Yep. Like, where is San Vicente Camp, right? Yeah. And then the next group, it's the same thing. They're clearly operating as a, as a, as a group. That's Whereas right. most of the people... They're just happenstance groups. They meet each other on the trail, or it's a familial group or something like that. Yeah. These Chinese are clearly not all family groups, right? They're like a little military unit, right? Right, right. And we see them group after group after group. Thank you, brother. <laughs>